Guy, you're putting together an exhibition of sculptures and paintings? Correct, yeah. These are oil paintings on glass. Called Considering the Theriothrope. Yeah. What's a theriothrope? Theriothrope is a, it's a Greek word for an animal and a human form. And I've been looking at it specifically regarding the, the sand, the bushmen, and the shamans, or the, 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 the healers in the community. They would go into massive, deep, very deep trances. And if they re reached a certain level of trance, often um, they would have these sort of brain uh, storms where imagery would, very much like a hallucination, which I haven't been in, I'm speaking <laughs> under, <laughs> under, <laughs> under what I've heard, but where you would hear, for instance, you, colors would have sounds. And often in a cultural situation, the imagery of the animals that they would see would fuse with the, the, the human forms. So what a shaman is, would be seeing would be a fusion of, as you see here, there's a human hands and there's a, a hoof with a suggestion of, a, of possibly a horn or some power coming out of the top. So a therianthrope is a fusion of human and animal forms. Very much like uh, the Egyptians had it, the Horus, the god of Horus. If you think of the satyr, the, the European sort of devil image with half goat, half hum, human. Um, and, and our, like you saw in, in, the, in Pan's Labyrinth. <coughs> exactly. Yeah. And um, our cultures have a huge acknowledgement to the animal form that is sort of morphing into the human form. And that essentially is a theory of throne. And God, why here in Eisner? Well, um, those mountains at the background there, in the long clue of just over at Bergplatz, are full of paintings, full of cave paintings. Some of the paintings come right down to the Neisner River. And yeah, you've experienced it. You, you've explored it. Yeah, I've been up into a number in the, in the long cliff and um, the, yeah, the long cliff, the Bergplatz, some beautiful sights just over the mountains. Literally, it's an hour's drive from Georgia. Uniondale. Yeah, yeah, not even that, in Uniondale. And I've been with a few experts, and I've been in a hell of a lot of contact with and researching all the latest sand rock art theories with David Lewis Williams' sort of groundbreaking theory, which postulates that all rock art was essentially, um, it had a spiritual value to it. So they weren't just, uh, they weren't the newspapers of the day? Not at all. If you go and look at a rock art site, you will not see a landscape in it, not one landscape. You will not see a picture of a flower. You will not see a cloud, mm. which they would have experienced all around them. Very often you see patterns, uh, like as if the finger has yeah. passed over the, the rock a couple of times. With, with, uh, well, with it's quite a difficult day. The, the, the argument now is that the, the pure sand um, were, were, did a fine line painting, very beautiful detailed paintings. Mm. Then from about 2000 years ago when the, uh, the herders moved into the area, the Khoi San, mm. um, there was a mixing of the pure sand hunter-gatherer and the herders. Mm. And then those two cultures began to merge and sometimes if the hunting wasn't so good in the, possibly with the, the hunter-gatherers, uh, try and get involved in a bit of herding. And that's where Slowly, as the years went by, the, the culture of the pure sand painters was lost. Mm -hmm. Until the last few hundred years, literally the last painter died out, 200 and roughly in the last 200 years. What do we know about the technology of their paint? There's a guy called Stephen Townley Bassett who's done a huge amount of research on what they used. And they used ochres, all ground natural ochres, but the paint was very symbolic because they often used egg egg and they would use the fat from a particular animal to use as a binding agent okay. so and, and blood as well so the specifics of what animal you used to bind what colors all had again a very symbolic and probably religious um, symbolism so it was certainly not just arbitrarily well let's mix a little bit of spit or this mm. there was huge thought uh, there was guano there was charcoal um, any um, particular chart, any particular colours they could find. And you've obviously put a huge thought into your, into your exhibition as well. Yes, I have. I've been, I've been fascinated. It's always been an interest in my life. My father obviously um, introduced me to the whole concept of 
the sort of Stone Age culture in this area. Yeah. And your father was a recorder of the history of this area. Yes, he was. Yeah, he was. And he wrote a lot. Um, a number of his books were sort of associated with what was what he yeah. called the Strunk Rivers, who lived specifically along the coast of uh, He was Yamatisan, and, and his books included uh, Deadly Presence. Yeah, and, and Master of None, Master of None yeah. Echoing Cliffs, and a number of others. Can you take us through one or two of the sculptures? Let's start with this one. Where does where where does it come from for, for Guy? Not not necessarily. I've, I'm personally very interested in animals, and um, the human form is always the actual pure human form has always been too daunting and too um, it's, it's been much too complicated a form to copy. Yeah. I, I'm much more interested in the uh, the emotions that the, the human form would give. Um, the influence here is, is naturally from a specifically would be from a dancing. Shama. But I have changed it. I've taken an image which probably once was somewhere reflected on a wall somewhere and put it into a three dimension. I've interpreted it as a three dimensional image, brought it, blown it up into onto bronze. Mm. And that's where I've sort of departed from the idea of a painting on a painting. Was this one particular image that, that inspired you no, to this one. Okay, no. so, so you can't say it was this big and now it's been... Not at all. Yeah. You will not find this image anywhere in a book. No, it's in your head. It's and in my head. And now in the branch. And I've created, and I've taken um, an influence from an image or a series of images. And for instance, this shape here, according to the shaman in a high trance, mm. they had this feeling of tremendous tingling power. They considered it as like a feeling of power leaving the back of their neck, mm. which is... Um, Typical trance or extreme trance feeling. And this is a suggestion of that. Yes. And a lot of the shaman in the deep trance would feel elongation, mm. but feel the body would be rising. Yeah. A little bit like a sort of a near death experience where people have this feeling of lifting and mm. weightlessness. So that's why this long neck and these long arms, sometimes the, the shaman would believe that they had more fingers than five or less. Mm. It was a, quite a common thing. And it's got the most beautiful hands. And um, <laughs> it was, and, and most of the sort of, it's very difficult, difficult to sex the yeah. male, female. Something yeah. oh, besides the obvious. But here is a sort of a, an amorphous, possibly asexual shape, mm. but has the characteristics of this elongation. Essentially, all these images are showing, my interpretation of, of an image, somebody in a deep trance, mm. and the com combining the human and animal in a three-dimensional form. That's what, is, that's what excites me. So I've taken a theme that I've seen on rocks and brought it into a three-dimensional form. A little bit about the rock that you're using to mount them on? This is a normal sandstone which comes straight out of the Karoo. Mm -hmm. So that is a link to their rock face that they're painted on. Because this is a typical sandstone, sort of quartz yeah. sandstone. And then very briefly, uh, um, because we not, don't really have a lot of time, the um, the paintings that you're going to be exhibiting? The paintings are a backup to try and explain the mystery and the enigma, I suppose, of the, the sand rock art. I don't think anyone's an expert, anyone has sort of closed the book on it. It's still very much open to... But that's the whole, the beauty of that is the sand rock art, isn't it? So it's, it's wonderful. It's open to huge interest. So a lot of these paintings, all of these paintings, I've taken and researched a specific um, quotation from the Bleak collection of where they interviewed a lot of the breakwater sand who were captured and transported to Cape Town mm -hmm. about 150 years ago. These are direct, direct quotations from them, translated from their language into Afrikaans and then English. Yeah. So there's been a lot of dislocation. And I'm trying to visually also interpret what they were saying. So here I've got a lot of the, the there will be a mixture of human and animal forms. There's human foot and animal head. Mm. So that's the paintings. And then I've also got a DVD showing actual, at real photographed therianthropes from a wall. From a wall, which you will ex which I'll exhibit show. Here on our TV. So finally, the exhibition runs from when to when, and uh, is, it can, can one see these, these works on the web anyway? Yeah, there is a website. That's, the exhibition kicks off on the 8th of May, mm -hmm. runs for three weeks at Neisner Fine Art. That's in Gray Street. In Gray Street, yeah. bottom of Gray Street. And um, there is a website 
which is, uh, I'll have to get it from. <laughs>